welcome to this episode of Orthodontics in Summary. Today's episode is looking at a review of white spot lesions and looking at the most recent evidence regarding the four main methods of resolving them when they occur. This was an excellent lecture given by Gail Glenn earlier this year at the AAO. She reviewed the etiology of what causes a white spot lesion and what things can affect its occurrence in the first place, and then the different modalities of treating it, looking at the management using fluoride, looking at resin infiltrate, looking at casein phosphopeptide calcium phosphate, yes I did practice saying that before this podcast several times, but also looking at microabrasion and her research combining those methodologies together to see what can result in the best outcome. To recap, the podcast is the opinion piece of myself and the orthodontics and summary team. We try our best to ensure it's as accurate as we can, but it may not be 100% representative of the original lecture. So what is the definition of a white spot lesion? Well, it's defined as a subsurface demineralization. There's an intact outer layer, and it's essentially the first signs of a carious lesion. What causes it? Simply, it's the plaque retention associated with appliances, both fixed appliances as well as attachments. It's a reduction in saliva access when we put any form of attachments on or appliances to patients. And they have an increased risk of cariogenic bacteria when appliances are placed. There's a question here about which type of appliance are aligners exempt from the creation of white spot lesions. And it was shown by the studies that actually white spot lesions do occur with aligners, but less than in fixed appliances. And that's in the order of one third of white spot lesions with clear aligner therapy. This was an Albaisi study from 2020, which showed that although there's an increase in the width of the actual lesion in clear aligners, there's a far less depth associated with it. How common are white spot lesions? Well, they occur in up to 97% of cases, an alarming quantity. Almost every patient has a potential to have one. They occur early in treatment, up to four weeks. And now, what are the things that can be done to prevent this? Well, it goes back to that fundamental aspect of communication. If we educate our patients well initially, it does reduce the overall rates of white spot lesions. What kind of things should we say? Well, actually, not only inform them of what is good oral hygiene, but the evidence also suggests that showing them the negative outcomes of poor oral hygiene is a very effective way to increase the hygiene during treatment. Now, if a white spot lesion occurs, what should we do? Well, once the appliances are removed, remineralization can take place by itself as long as there's good oral hygiene. How long should we wait? Well, actually, in the first six weeks is where we get the most remineralization occurring without additional agents. This can take up to six months to improve. So what Glenny's advice was, was to wait approximately three to six months post removal of appliances to monitor the patient before considering any additional treatment. Where does fluoride stand in this process? Well, we all appreciate that fluoride can, in, can result in increased remineralization taking place. It forms fluoroapatite. It produces a harder surface of the tooth. However, when it comes to this application for white spot lesions during appliance therapy, it can be cumbersome to use. Now, the evidence suggests it reduces white spot lesions by 44% but it involves the removal of first the actual arch wire, then it involves removal of the plaque from around the teeth. And what was suggested by Glennie is that it's actually quite difficult to do this and to often repeat it in clinical practice. What about after we finish orthodontic treatment and we've now got this white spot lesion? Should we use high fluoride concentration? Well, Gail suggested that we should not be using high concentration fluoride in the presence of a white spot lesion. And that's because it forms that hypermineralized surface layer. But unfortunately, the white spot lesion has depth to it. So we end up sealing off the demineralized surface of the actual lesion itself, which is subsurface layer. As a consequence, the lesion can visibly remain. And that's Bishara's study from 2008. Next up is resin infiltrate. So resin infiltrate was proposed by Gray in 2002. And essentially involves the removal of the outer hypomineralized area by using 15% hydrofluoric acid. It's then infiltrated by using low viscosity resin. And it has a profound improvement in the aesthetics and has an immediate effect that takes place. It also arrests the lesion from continuing. However, 
small aspects of demineralized content can remain and it may not get to the depth of the actual lesion itself. There is a lack of long-term evidence, but according to Jiang's 2023 systematic review, this was the most effective method of managing a white spot lesion. There are costs and also long-term data still absent. Next up is casein phosphopeptide calcium phosphate. Again, rehearsed several times. Let's call it MI PACE just for ease. And this was reckoned from 2012. And what, K what MI PACE is, it's a milk protein derivative. It works to stabilize calcium phosphate and essentially enables a reservoir of liquid enamel to be around the brackets and attachments. Simple to apply, just involves a micro brush to be used or finger and the tongue distributes it around the patient's brackets and teeth. It can be swallowed and patients are simply advised not to have anything to eat to drink for 30 to 60 minutes afterwards. Now this was the third most effective way to resolve a white spot lesion according to Jiang's systematic view from 2023. Next up is microabrasion. So microabrasion is the combination of both acid and an abrasive particle which is essentially burnished into the enamel using a slow speed handpiece. Now Opal Lustra is a commercial example. It uses 6% hydrochloric acid and silica. Slightly lower concentration of acid and slightly larger particle size has been shown to be the most effective. Essentially one millimeter is placed around the actual lesion itself and as mentioned burnished in using a polishing cup and slow speed handpiece. It takes around about a minute. Now one of the challenges of microabrasion is it's not widely accepted and it's a massive variation in the protocols that are used. Technically, it should be used with rubber dam, which can make it challenging. Now, what Gale did was looked at combining some of these modalities of, of resolving a white spot lesion, namely the use of MI paste combined with microabrasion. Gale went on to describe a split mass study that she had carried out. Now, this was using MI paste on both right and left hand sides, but combining one side of the mouth with microabrasion. And they looked at patients after six months and they carried out a systematic approach to the investigation. And what they found in their conclusion was that MI paste is very effective at reducing the white spot lesion. However, when it's combined with microabrasion, there's a far more statistically and clinically significant reduction in the size of the lesion. So to give you some points of comparison, with using MI paste, there's a 5.5 reduction in the lesion. With microabrasion combined with MI paste, it's 7.4 times the reduction in those white spot lesions. One of the concerns of using microabrasion is that it can be the loss of enamel, but also the sheer time that it takes to do. If it's a minute per tooth, doing it eight times, what Gill suggested is that it can take up to an hour to do. This just isn't clinically practical, although her research supports its use. What she suggested is the application of it in clinical practice, isolated to one to two teeth. Now, I loved Gill's presentation. She gave very clear statistical and clinical differences through the use of MI paste and microabrasion. However, she did that really enlightened component of research is that she contextualized it into clinical practice and what was practical to do. She critiqued the applicability of her own research and she concluded that it can be used in the real world, but has a limited application of it. A fantastic lecture from a clinical academic. As always, please do subscribe and look forward to next episode.